Hey, what's up guys? My name is Cameron Gallagher and today we're talking all about shared storage solutions. So let's get into it. Hey, hey, what's up? How's it going? Zach, can you do me a favor? Can you send me all the project files? Which files? It was a project like, I don't know, it's been a while back now. Okay, um, do you remember what year the the project was from? Like, <sighs> dude, I don't know, 2018, 2019, 1919. It was the one with the talking shrimp. Shrimp, shrimp. The mascot for that one thing, right? No, they were shrimp. Oh, okay. Just like, was it the short guy? No, literal shrimp. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. I don't know that one. I'm gonna need the transcribed one, so it'd be the Spanish one. Um, I think those were before I started working here. Uh, do you know where they might be? Like on a raid or something? It could be on a floppy disk, I'm not sure, but it's somewhere. Do you think that, that, yeah, no, yeah, I think... I think I, I think I could do that. Should be no problem. Okay, yeah. Send over whenever you're ready. Ooh. Oh, no, 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 All right, so maybe you've lived that skip before and maybe you know exactly what I'm talking about. The trouble of having to track down footage and figure out where it is on what hard drive. And this is where having a NAS or a network detect storage comes in real handy. Now we had picked up one of these a little while ago and got everything set up and I wanted to make a video kind of talking about why this might be a good fit for you, how we have it set up, or why it actually may not work for you. So the NAS is actually the QNAP and I wanted to use my phone for this TVS X72 XT NAS. This is technically an 8-bay NAS because it has two NVMe SSDs and then also has six main 3.5 or 2.5 inch hard drives. So we are actually running six 14 terabyte Seagate drives in this as well as two one terabyte NVMe drives that we'll talk about how we have that set up in a little bit later. So between the NAS and the hard drives and some of the actual things like we needed a PCIe adapter, which of course we'll have the links for everything down in the description below, the total came to be about $5,460. So obviously, right off the bat, this is a big expense. This is a lot of gear. Be prepared to spend a lot of money jumping into this because it is a pretty big upgrade. But again, if you need it, it's something that's gonna work out. Three, two, one, format. Okay, so we're gonna go take a look at the NAS setup that we have here at WorkSmart and how we're running the NAS um, between Zach and I. So obviously, you know, as I'll talk about in some of the other A-roll, the idea is that a NAS is a central editing system. It's something that we can use where we can edit off kind of a central hard drive. So that's kind of the, the basic version of it. Um, but, you know, it gives you enough of an idea that when you see the setup, you'll kind of understand what's going on. The key thing in the setup is that it has to be connected to both computers as quickly or, you know, as sort of like raw throughput as we possibly can. But it also has to be connected to the router. So it has to be connected to the internet here. Do do. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, so we are here in my office where the NAS actually lives right here. So this is the QNAP NAS. This is the TVS. I think it's the, yeah, 7XT. Um, and it's a 8-bay. It also has two SSDs. So anyway, this is connected in a few different ways. First off, it is connected to our internet. So there is a, there's two 1 gig, one 10 gigabit, and then there's also uh, two Thunderbolt on the back. So the one of the one gigabyte, or excuse me, gigabit, so that's just like your typical standard internet speed, is going right over here <clears throat> to the, you know, just the internet. So that's to the router where the NAS is actually getting its information of, you know, what is my IP address, that kind of stuff. I'll go into this a little bit more, but that's just kind of the basic idea. And then it is connected via Thunderbolt to my actual computer. So Thunderbolt, allows for this type of connectivity because Thunderbolt's like a smart connection. So it pretty much allows my computer to see it as a network device still, but it understands that it can run at Thunderbolt speed and it's just a little bit smarter. So it's easier than having to run a 10 gig 
uh, you know, out of the back and split it and have a switch and all that kind of stuff. So I am direct connected through Thunderbolt. And um, like I said, the main saving point is not having to have that 10 gig switch because if Zach and I both had 10 gig, uh, first off, I don't even have a 10 gig uh, actual like input on my computer, so it wouldn't even matter. Um, I'd have to get an adapter anyway, so it's just way easier to have the Thunderbolt right in. So from the 10 gig in the NAS, we go out to a patch in the wall over to Zach's office. Let's go check that out. Okay, so here in Zach's office, the 10 gig patch comes through and it comes right here to his computer. Now, one thing to note about 10 gigabit, so 10 gigabit can actually run on Cat 5E, I believe, cable up to, it's like 150 feet or something. So in our case, even though we're a little over the 150 feet between the patch, doesn't really matter because we're not saturating that 10 gig anyway. So, you know, whatever the footage would be, you know, most footage we're probably pulling maybe two to 300 megabytes per second. So we're totally fine. So even though you're losing a little bit and it's not a true full 10 gig throughput, it's not that big of a deal. But it is going into Zach's computer here, which has a 10 gigabit ethernet adapter from QNAP. So it's a PCIe card. We just installed it into the computer. And yeah, I mean, you know, you update the drivers and you have to, of course, mount the drives and things like that. But this way we are both connected through the network and both of our computers see this, you know, storage device, this RAID as a drive. One thing I didn't mention too is that the NAS is actually powered off of a PSU. So this is an external power battery backup. So basically if the power goes out, it is going to keep that NAS on, which is going to keep our data safe, but it's also going to keep us from having issues if it were to like disconnect from the router to get a new IP address and stuff like that, which I'll mention a little bit more about later. So we have these six 14 terabyte drives set up in a RAID 6. So of course we have 84 terabytes of raw storage and we could use it like that, but the safer option was to use RAID 6, which allows for two drive failure. So technically two of the hard drives can fail and our data is still safe and it's still in its normal place. Now we're also using the two one terabyte NVMe drives as SSD cache. So basically what the NAS can do is allow two terabytes to be sort of set aside for really fast transfers on and off the NAS. And then what the NAS does in the background is sort of offload that to the slower hard drives. And for us, most times we're ingesting or sort of copying footage, we're not gonna be moving more than two terabytes at a time because in a day we'd probably shoot maybe max a terabyte and a half. So the great thing is, is when we're offloading the cards, it's at the full rate speed of our cards or the readers or whatever the other bottleneck would be. And it's all going onto the NAS pretty much at full speed using those SSDs as a cache, and then again, tossing it off in the background to those other drives. So it just makes offloading and onloading footage super simple and very, very fast. Now, one thing that really came up to me was how am I going to back this up? Because of course, RAID 6, although it is very safe, is still not a backup. You still have to have some type of way of backing this up. Basically, the best option that I found was using what's called Backblaze and their B2 account. So Backblaze, of course, has their like $9 a month unlimited backup, but it's not super business friendly because you really can't work off something like a NAS or any of those types of devices. That is strictly for the B2 backup. So what the B2 backup does is it can take a device like a NAS or a server and it can back the entire thing up, identical backups, you know, weekly, daily, whatever you decide to choose. And the great part is, is that because it's an identical copy, it is keeping all of that very accessible where you can just go online, download it, you can get a hard drive and then you can ship it back to get a re, uh, kind of like a reimbursement. So there's a ton of different ways. It's basically just a backup. It's nothing too crazy, but you do have to set it up in the NAS. This is something that's within the NAS Linux software that has to be set up. And the downside to that is you do actually pay per gigabyte. So for whatever amount of footage you're uploading, you are paying per gig and you're also paying per gig you have to download. So if you lose a bunch of footage, you do have to pay to re-download that footage later. Now, I know what you're thinking that might sound a little ridiculous, but I mean, this is a business solution. This is a really high-end professional solution, and hopefully you don't need it. So how does a NAS actually work? Well, basically, it is seen over the network as a network device. And then what you do on the computers, whether it's Windows or Mac, is you have to connect or sort of tell your computer that that network device you want to see as a hard drive. So on Windows, you are mapping the network drive. So you're taking that network source and you're saying, hey, this is a drive now. This is drive B or drive D or drive Z, whatever you want to choose. And on Mac, it's a little more simple. It kind of just automatically does this, but you are having to connect them through what's called SMB. Now there's a ton of different like protocols you can use to connecting the NAS to your computer, but SMB seems to work the best and it's just 
is telling the computer, hey, you need to see this as a storage. So once we do that, now the NAS is its own storage. It is its own hard drive that can be shared between users. So Zach and I both have login information and we can log into our NAS, attach it, you know, do the whole network uh, mapping, all the network drive sort of stuff. And then at that point, it is a hard drive. It is just pretending like it is a hard drive on our computer and we can edit off it and do things on it just like any other drive. And obviously this enables collaborative editing and things like DaVinci Resolve. So if you're trying to do collaborative editing, you need to use a NAS or server or some type of network device in order to share that footage, but also to house the projects. And I'll talk more about why that can be sort of difficult later on. Okay, so now I want to probably try to convince you maybe to not buy a NAS. So this whole video I've been talking about what it is and what it does and why it works, but there are a lot of downsides to this NAS. And honestly, if you leave anything from this video, I want you to realize how important these things are to know and kind of how intense this whole process really is. And it's been for me and Zach, who both of us are very technical people. We know a lot about computers, a lot about technology. So we're not someone who is just kind of the average user. And I want to start by saying, if you are somebody who works by yourself, you don't need a NAS. Like you really, really don't need a NAS. Just use a RAID, just use a, a local RAID, something very simple. For us, it was at the point where we're working together, we're doing collaborative projects. We needed the NAS because we had to have the device that could work and talk between all of them. So in our case, we had to, and I would really strongly recommend waiting until you truly have to because there is a lot of cost overhead and a lot of expense and potential problems that can actually cause you some serious other issues. Because if your NAS goes down or something doesn't work, now you and employee or employees, depending on what you're doing, are unable to work. And we've had that a few times. So I want to caution you before going ahead with this, you really should think about this thoroughly and make sure that you need it. The first thing is that this setup process can be incredibly intense. Not only just setting up the NAS and the drives and the RAID and all of those, but setting up the networking. So one of the things that is so obviously pivotal to the NAS is the network connection. So it needs to be able to talk to your router and your local network to work properly. It has to obtain an IP address from that network. And one thing that we ran into is the NAS needs to keep its IP address. So meaning if the entire building were to turn off, the NAS is possibly going to get a new reassigned IP address from that router, unless you tell the router and the NAS, hey, I want you to use this same IP address. And the other issue with that is in order to set up the PostgreSQL, which is sort of the way that DaVinci Resolve can see uh, the NAS and say like, hey, I'm gonna put all my projects on the NAS. In order to do that, you have to use something called Container Station, at least in QNAP. In Synology, it might be different. In other softwares might be different. So the problem is, is that if you lose your IP address or your IP address changes, Container Station, which holds all of the information for Resolve, now doesn't know what to do. So it's not just like, oh, well, I'll just go back and tell the you know router, hey, this is my IP address again. The problem is now Container Station doesn't know where to look. So you not only have to change the IP address on the NAS and also on the router, but you also need to make sure that Container Station, all three of these, and DaVinci Resolve, know they're all the same thing. So I know it sounds very confusing, it is. You need to really know what you're doing and you have to have a lot of networking knowledge. And honestly, setting up Container Station was very difficult. And I actually had a friend of mine, Mark, who is an incredible just tech mind. He was able to kind of walk me through a lot of the steps and get it set up because I know nothing about networking and it really showed when I started to set up the NAS. And I think, again, if you were someone thinking about this, really do your research and really find someone who knows what they're talking about because QNAP's website, DaVinci Resolve's website, you know, Blackmagic Design, they had like no information on how to properly set this up and they were totally wrong on quite a bit of things. So keep that in mind. Remember that each person's setup is totally different. One of the reasons why I'm not gonna do a video on how to set up the PostgreSQL or Container Station or actually setting up the NAS is because they are very different from setup to setup. So each NAS is different, each RAID or that, you know, the hard drive setup is different, the container stations are different, your IP addresses and all that stuff are all different. So I can't really tell you how to set it up. I can just kind of give you the rough idea, but you'd have to know all of these networking terms and also all of the references that you need in order to do this. So again, that's kind of where having that experience and, and you know, some type of networking experience comes in a lot of handy. One thing I didn't really mention too much is that if you're on Windows or you're all using 10 gigabit, you actually need a 10 gigabit switch. So the only reason why that we didn't have one is because we only had one computer via 10 gigabit and then the other computer, my computer, was via Thunderbolt. 
So you could connect two computers via Thunderbolt or you can connect one computer or actually three computers. So two Thunderbolt, one 10 gig. But the minute you need to have two 10 gig, so two of them coming off that 10 gig, you now need a 10 gig switch, which adds a massive expense and a whole other sort of possible bottleneck or place that things can break. So again, you gotta keep a lot of these things in mind when you're going into it and do your research and thoroughly think these through because there's a lot to learn. One thing that we learned that was kind of a, a big issue at first too was that the NAS needs to be mounted. So one thing that happened, especially on Zach's computer, is that Windows registered this public drive and said, hey, we can see this NAS, but it wasn't actually mounting it as a drive. And I explained more with that earlier, but still it's one thing to keep in mind is you might be having problems because your computer is not seeing the NAS as a drive. It's just seeing it as a network location. And those are two very different things. One massive problem we ran into was actually an auto update. So you really wanna turn off the auto updates inside of the NAS software because what happened was is when we had this auto update, we actually lost the container station and all of the information that DaVinci Resolve uses to say, hey, I know what's going on, was completely wiped out because of the, I think it's 5.0 in QNAP software. So you also wanna really make sure that you're not updating stuff, you're not updating your computer maybe as often or the software because all of these things are very fragile and the more variability you add, the more possibilities for real issues that we ran into. I actually had to go in and downgrade the NAS from 5.0 to 4.5.9 or something. For us, that took us an entire day of shutting down and, and actually it was more like two days of not knowing what was going on and not getting any work done. Lastly, if all else fails, call QNAP customer service because one thing I will say is their customer service has been awesome. They're actually able to sort of like pipe into your computer and hop right on the NAS and do this stuff for you. So like I didn't know what was going on with a problem we were having and they went in, they checked it, they made sure our virtual switch was all lined up and working properly. Uh, they're really awesome. So if you are running into issues, contact their customer service support line, talk to them, figure out what's going on, they'll figure it out. But anyway guys, that is sort of a NAS in a nutshell. I know that was a lot of negativity at the end, but I really just wanna make sure that you as a viewer understand that this is a pretty large undertaking. It's not something you want to jump into saying like, oh, I need a NAS or I need a big storage device. You know, let's just get a NAS. There is a lot that goes into it and there's a lot to keep it up and running properly. So just keep that in mind when you're looking into it. Anyway guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to let me know of any comments or questions you have down below. Again, we're not IT guys, so we can't really explain maybe too much in depth, but we can try to answer as many questions as possible. I'll also leave a link down in the description to all of the information and all the gear or all the resources we use. All that gear will be affiliate links too, so if you do buy through there, it helps us out, especially because these are kind of big ticket items. So anyway guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, come subscribe, and I'll catch you guys later.